Okay. Bansuria, yeah, you, you want to announce and start? Please? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, um, I think it's my uh, pleasure to kind of actually um, start our very first um, sessions for the year uh, 2023. And basically, it is um, uh, uh, an initiative that Professor Nakui and myself have actually started since 2018. We've been doing this for the last um, four or five years, even before COVID. Uh, the numbers have actually only increased over the years, gone to show proof that this is quite a popular webinar. Um, so I would really kind of um, appreciate that um, all of you can kind of actually, um, you know, attend this on a regular basis. We do have our YouTube um, webinar series that you can actually watch any old videos. And basically, uh, this is a monthly occurrence. Uh, we do actually take some break uh, during the summer um, holidays, but we will announce that in, in, in advance. Um, so without further ado, I will ask my um, chair um, of the Jamie webinar series, Professor Nekwi, to announce our guest speakers and uh, to actually start from there. Thank you very much, Professor Nekwi. Yeah, thank you. Thank yeah, you, thank you, you Masood. Uh, so, uh, great pleasure to have uh, Dr. Cherry uh, Pelli with us. Bharat. Uh, I've known Bharat for many, many years. We actually trained together uh, in uh, Scotland, and then he moved uh, to England, and I followed him. Bharat, uh, very good friend of mine, very, very nice and um, And he's a stroke physician and neurologist and stroke physician in Salford. Manchester, and the other speaker we have is Dr. Amir Zadi, who is a in the U in USA. So we will start with uh, with Parak Shaykhali. So if you would like to so start sharing screen. So the first presentation is on the management of hyperacute strokes, and this these presentations are really aimed at uh, new doctors, early graders. But obviously, we do have lots of consultants who attend these meetings, and and of course GPs and allied allied doctors. So, Parat, uh, you're, you're ready. Okay. Let me share my slide and uh, so, uh, can you see my slides? Okay. Yeah. 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 We Good. Thank you, um, uh, Nasim. Um, it's a great pleasure to to uh, talk uh, uh, about a stroke. Um, and uh, thank you for uh, asking me to speak. So um, I'll try and kind of summarize uh, some of the evidence in uh, stroke management. I think uh, there's a lot has been changed in the last sort of 10 uh, years. Um, and and uh, so try and go through uh, some of the developments uh, uh, in a sort of summarizing way. So next slide. So we need to understand the burden of stroke uh, to, to know how important it is to, to um, you know, to identify and treat these patients. Uh, so, so there's about 12 million people um, uh, suffer from stroke every year over the, over the last sort of, um, 20, 30 years, the, the, the stroke incidence has increased um, uh, and, and about 100 million people uh, uh, at a given time are living uh, in the world with stroke. Also over the years, uh, the uh, incidence of stroke is, uh, is, is now one in four people will have a stroke at, in their lifetime, which is incre increased by 50% in the last sort of 17 years. We always think stroke as a disease of elderly people, but that's that's trend seems to be moving on to people, um, you know, below 70 years uh, uh, seem to seem to be having more strokes. Um, and also uh, the cardiovascular disease, absolute risk, uh, uh, you, you know, you, you know, even people with lower moderate cardiovascular risk uh, seem to be affected with stroke. So the trends are changing and, uh, and, 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 and uh, it seems to be affecting more people in the low socioeconomic countries and uh, their, uh, their disability and the deaths from the stroke is highly prevalent in, in low socioeconomic countries. So again, sort of in, it's important how the resources are used in the world. Um, so previously this stroke uh, 
uh, used to be uh, classified under uh, cardiovascular diseases, but the ICD-11 um, has, has moved that to neurological uh, disease, which is, which is of course, is, is an important uh, development. Now, when, you, when we talk about the, uh, the uh, importance of time in managing uh, stroke, I think this concept of time is, time is brain is, is really crucial. Um, because every uh, every a minute of delay in managing these patients, uh, about two million neurons die. So that's about like uh, you know if you don't uh, treat pa these patients like every hour uh, there's a delay, the brain ages by about three to four years uh, um, of aging. So which is which is a huge uh, uh, rapid death of cells. And that's where uh, the, uh, the importance of stroke service configuration comes into play because the time is crucial. And uh, so, so there are public campaigns to identify stroke patients much rapidly. So in the UK, there is a phase arm speech time test for, patient, uh, for people to recognize patients with stroke. And the service designs have been sort of set up in different ways in different countries. Uh, so uh, the terminology commonly used for primary stroke centers is, is hospital with facility for thrombolysis and comprehensive stroke center is where you have thrombectomy and thrombolysis. And then the concept of mothership and a drip on ship models have been used where um, patients are taken to comprehensive stroke centers directly for thrombolysis and thrombectomy treatment, which is the mothership model. And a drip and ship model is where the patient is treated in the primary stroke center with thrombolysis and then taken to comprehensive stroke center for thrombectomy. And uh, there is a trade-offs between these two models where which works better in, in which place, depending on um, the geographical distribution of the population, how long it takes patients to be taken to, to the hospital. So in some places, you know, um, mothership model might work better uh, if, if the patient is taken to hospital within, within 30 minutes to comprehensive stroke center. Um, they may benefit more uh, going, to the, going to center with thrombectomy. But if they live far away, uh, they probably benefit, benefit from thrombolysis in their primary stroke center before they are set to a uh, comprehensive stroke center. Um, and like that, uh, of course, in rural areas, there has been uh, some uh, evidence of using telemedicine for um, you know, uh, administering the, uh, the, the thrombolysis and then transferring patient over. And in some countries like Germany, they've used mobile stroke units um, where there could be a CT scanner in the uh, ambulance and uh, and thrombolysis advice is given before they're, um, they're brought to, to uh, a stroke unit. So, uh, so in assessing the stroke patients, the important thing of course is to identify uh, and diagnose strokes. Um, and by definition, stroke is a, a sudden uh, focal neurological deficit of presumed vascular origin. Um, and 85% of these strokes, uh, as you will know, are ischemic strokes and 15% are hemorrhagic strokes. History is crucial. Um, and and uh, you always have to get history from uh, family, uh, collateral history, so that uh, clear uh, onset time is de determined. And when you try to assess these patients, sometimes uh, you you can be confused with people coming to uh, coming to, to the door and so they're fluctuating symptoms sometimes, but that still could be vascular. Although acute onset and persisting neurological deficit is by definition stroke. But if you hear a patient saying gradually progressive symptoms, um, you have to think about alternative diagnosis. And and as, as you will know that there are. Stroke mimics that come through to us, uh, uh, about 20 to 25% of stroke um, assessments are, are, are stroke mimics. And uh, that could be anything. Essentially, I'll give you a small list there, which are common stroke mimics, but there are plenty uh, others that come through uh, as a suspected stroke. 
So when you're seeing these patients, you have to do a rapid assessment. So you have to make sure they're, uh, they're, they're A, B, C, D, E, uh, they're stabilized, and, and then you uh, use a rapid assessment, which is sort of a NIH stroke scale, um, uh, which is actually a research tool, but it, it, it gives a sort of uh, uh, ability to assess patients much more quickly. Um, and and, and the, you, then you go through the investigations, uh, uh, which I will, I will explain in the next slides. And then you um, uh, uh, administer treatments, which could be reperfusion therapies um, or conservative management, depending on your conclusive uh, 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 opinion. Other thing you need to know about these patients is that what's their baseline um, uh, baseline functionings. For that, we use a modified ranking scale. MRS zero is someone who has uh, got no symptoms and very active. MRS six is dead. So you know, going from zero to six uh, with increasing disability. This is crucial in identifying the prognosis of the patients and also uh, uh, offering uh, specific treatments depending on their disability which I'll come to, uh, come to that later. So the NHS stroke scale uh, is what is widely used. Uh, and as I mentioned, it's actually a research tool, but uh, it's, it's widely used in clinical practice. So uh, different, different uh, neurological components uh, are scaled from zero to, um, to four. Zero is no deficit and, and two or three or four, depending on which component you're looking at, is the maximal deficit. And as you can see in that list, you've got um, um, visual assessment, then you have level of consciousness, they have motor functioning and sensory assessment and, and, and uh, language and uh, speech. There's uh, patients with posterior circulation stroke and patients with non-dominant um, uh, hemisphere stroke, um, this scale is not necessarily accurate. So it might underestimate the deficit in, in those patients. You have to be obviously careful of uh, scaling uh, the patient with posterior circulation stroke and uh, non-dominant hemisphere stroke. So in terms of well, how this NHS stroke scale is useful, um, it is useful to identify the severity of stroke. Um, and of course, uh, TIA means patients who dealt, resolve symptoms within, within 24 hours by definition. Mm -hmm. And then if the NHS stroke scale is zero to five, it's classified as a minor stroke. Five to 15 is moderate uh, severe stroke and 16 to 20 is moderate, uh, uh, um, moderate to severe and 21 uh, upwards uh, to 42 is the maximum score is severe stroke. Um, and um, within the minor stroke patients who are scoring uh, zero to five, and you have to try and identify uh, which of those patients have disabling uh, as opposed to non-disabling minor stroke because again, when do you give treatment for those minor stroke patients? Dep depends on is it disabling or not. And again, I think you know disability again de depends on what they do and what's affected, and you know can they speak and they use their hand to write and so on. Yeah. Um, so the imaging plays a vital role in, in, in identifying these stroke patients, excluding stroke mimics, identifying the extent of uh, the stroke damage. And of course, if you're using uh, angiogram, you can identify patients uh, who have a, a large vessel occlusion uh, who may benefit from thrombectomy. And then if you have facility for doing perfusion imaging, then you can also identify patients uh, for reperfusion treatments beyond the traditional treatment windows, uh, which I'll come to later. I think... Uh, some of you may be familiar that the technology of AI has come into uh, uh, really use in stroke patients for using uh, a rapid uh, software, for example, is, is one of the software, but there are other platforms uh, which are automated systems like uh, um, 
uh, once the patient gets a CTA, a CT perfusion in plain CT is done, it's automatically uploaded into the uh, into the cloud, and 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 you uh, you get a maps and uh, automated uh, pictures telling you if there is a if there is a, a large vessel occlusion, if there is um, a perfusion uh, a mismatch. So it's really come into uh, very good use uh, in stroke patients. Um, so when you're seeing a patient, uh, the CT scan, um, again, you have to try and learn what, what are the things that you're likely to find. So early ischemic stroke signs, um, you might see a dense um, vessel, uh, which is the first image on the left, um, uh, showing law, uh, a dense left uh, MCA artery. Uh, you might see a loss of insular ribbon uh, as, as pointed in the second picture and uh, blurring of the lentiform nucleus. The best way to remember that is imagine that as ice cream cone, you're missing the cone and that's the picture three. And the, the next to it, that is loss of gray white matter differentiation. And the last one is the sulcal effacement. So these are useful clues and positively identifying stroke diagnosis and also looking at the extent of uh, the injury. The other, cons other useful tool in uh, plain CT scan is uh, assessing their aspect score. Aspect score is, um, is sort of 10 is the best score, i.e. when you see when you say 10, you're not seeing any early ischemic changes in any of those regions. So at the level of basal ganglia, you have a different regions uh, of the brain. You, you, you lose one score if you see, let's say, if you see a hypoattenuation in M2 area, you lose one score. Like that, if you're losing more areas, it goes down, um, uh, the score goes down. So, you know, if it is a five or below, it means very severe stroke. 10 is, you're not seeing any early ischemic signs. For example, the top image, as you can see, kind of highlighted there, you're losing two, which is the caudate and the lentiform nucleus in that area. Um, and I think you're losing the insular as well. So you 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 score seven. You're losing three uh, parts of that uh, in that in that uh, um, uh, regions. Um, so in the bottom one, uh, I've just shown that picture just because um, this is what Rapid software gives you. Again, Rapid gives aspect score as well. Uh, again, it's useful. Sometimes it may not be accurate, but it's useful too. Um, just again, briefly touching upon understanding the, um, the, the vascular anatomy is crucial, um, especially when you're trying to identify stroke syndromes um, and, 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 and uh, uh, when you're looking at their uh, angiograms uh, um, to, to, uh, and you're discussing with, with, with the uh, neuroradiologist, you need to sort of uh, understand how the, uh, how the vascular anatomy is. Um, so uh, again, just briefly touching upon that, uh, dep depending on uh, the vascular territory affected, uh, as you can see in this in this figure, you have different syndromes. The classical syndromes are MCA stroke syndromes, um, but uh, also you have ACA, sort of PCA syndrome, and then you have posterior circulation, which can be a pica, or top of the vascular or, or vascular artery stroke. Uh, I'm not going in detail of those presentations, but just to be aware of uh, the importance of anatomy and, and the stroke syndromes in relation to that. I briefly mentioned earlier about the, the AI. I think this is what you get, rapid is one, and in the brainomics, I think some centers use brainomics in the UK particularly, um, and it gives you sort of a, a nice pictures and, 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 and tells you if there is a LVO um, or if there is a uh, um, what's the aspect score, for example. Um, I'm just going to say, so this is what you get in, in rapid software. It says LVO detected so nicely. Uh, so, you know, if you're in a, a primary stroke center, you may not have a radiologist looking at all the scans and reporting in time. So when you have a rapid software, it shows this, you could just pick up a phone and, uh, you know, call comprehensive stroke center and, and discuss the patient. So it's Marat, just a uh, uh, quick one, sorry, uh, uh, sorry, you have know, got about 40 slides and uh, each speaker has about 20 minutes, so you may wish to focus more on the management part, uh, 
Um, if you are on slide 17, and I see you have 48, you may not be able to cover all the photos. Nassim, I can't, I can't hear. Uh, sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear quite clear there. No, I, I, no. we can't hear you properly, but I can, I can play the Hello. message. Bharat, um, I think what Professor Nakhvi is saying, um, you know, we've got 20, 25 minutes for each presenter. We, we can see that you are on 17 or 48. So yeah. you may want to actually maybe just fast forward to some of the management aspects. Um, that's right, possible. that's right. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just going to um, uh, quickly go through uh, the, uh, what I will do is I'll just, um, yeah, okay. So I think, um, probably this is the important slide. So I think the, the management strategies at the moment is that if the patients are coming within four and a half hours, um, and um, so they are eligible for IV thrombolysis, then then there's a treatment. And uh, if they're presenting under six hours, zero to six hours, some of the patients may be eligible for mechanical thrombectomy. As I said, if they have a large vessel occlusion. And uh, beyond that, I think um, uh, there is uh, emerging evidence if you use uh, perfusion imaging, particularly, um, uh, potentially they might be able, eligible for thrombectomy and thrombolysis is probably still not, there's great, great evidence for thrombolysis beyond four and a half hours, but I think it is emerging evidence. I think it might come into use in the, in the, in, in the future. Um, so I think, I'm not sure how much time I have, but um, let me see. Um, sure, should we say another five minutes, and uh, Professor Nakhvi? Another five minutes. Yeah, 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 that's fine. yeah, that's fine. Is that all right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. 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 So um, I think the uh, so the so the patients come through uh, to through um, pre-hospital triage. Often you get alerted, and then you have. Um, you know, you assess them and you exclude hypoglycemia more importantly. And you, uh, you know, once you, uh, you know, once you uh, diagnose stroke, then you have to sort of determine the time uh, of the onset. So if they're presenting within four and a half hours, you do a plain CT and you do a CTA. If you feel that patients is scoring NHS to a scale of uh, more than six, um, and 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 then you uh, detect a large vessel occlusion. Uh, then you, they go for thrombectomy if they are within six hours. Uh, but if they don't have a large vessel occlusion, then of course, if they're within four and a half hours, you uh, give thrombolysis. And I think beyond that time, as I mentioned earlier, so it depends on you know facilities for your perfusion imaging, you might be able to give uh, a thrombectomy so, uh, for, for these patients up to 24 hours, uh, particularly if they have vascular artery occlusion, they, they can benefit up to 24 hours. Um, so, so some of the concepts that I, uh, I, I find very useful is people who are, let's say, waking up with stroke, um, you can use a DWR flare mismatch concept. Uh, so if you have a, a bright DWR lesion, but no flare lesion, so people who are waking up with stroke, now that could be a criteria for uh, giving thrombolysis. Um, uh, so there's a nice trial called wake-up trial. Uh, so, so these are the patients who are not thrombolyzed at the moment, but I think the problem is doing MR scans. So um, I just want to quick maybe skip this one. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to skip this one. So, so the benefit of thrombolysis, I think it's it's well well known and it's is a good evidence, uh, uh, and this is one of the meta-analyses um, showing that um, uh, showing that benefit uh, up to four and a half hours is 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 definitely there. And previously, it used to be a very strict criteria for excluding patients above certain age, but now it's well known again that age is not uh, should not be a criteria for excluding thrombolysis as well as stroke severity. Um, so so um, I'm going to skip that. And um, I think the important thing is obviously making sure that um, that you you know you sort of try and aim for dose needle time of you know at least fifty minutes. But I think that some of the centers were aiming for forty minutes dose needle time so that thrombolysis you know is given you know urgently. Um, I'm just going to skip this one as well. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so. I think this probably just in, in a quick um, mention of 
improving the thrombolysis rates. I think, you know, obviously all the centers are trying to um, and identify patients and, uh, you know, uh, and, 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 and administer treatment for as many patients as possible. But I think, I think there is a scope to improve, uh, in, uh, in, you know, in all the centers. And um, the, the aim for thrombolysis rates is about 20% of stroke um, admissions. At the moment, I think it's about 12% in, in UK. Uh, these are the complications of thrombolysis. Um, and, and again, sort of just to be aware of. Um, if I have two minutes, I'll just talk about a thrombectomy quickly. Yeah, sure, yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. So the benefit of thrombectomy, I think if I have to say, you know, is that it's, 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 it's again, sort of all the trials um, uh, have shown that if you, if you have a patient under six hours, if they have a large vessel occlusion, the benefit is, is you know, there's no doubt about benefits. For example, one, you have to treat two, two and a half patients for one patient to be less disabled than 90 days. And uh, you have to treat five patients uh, so one patient is achieving functional independence at 90 days. So it's, you know, it's, it, it's a really good evidence. So there's about 20% of absolute, uh, absolute uh, benefit uh, with thrombectomy. So, which is, which is, which is much better than thrombolysis, but only in selected population. I think that's the most important thing. So that means that thrombolysis still plays a big role in all these patients uh, before they throw, gave in thrombectomy uh, for eligible patients. And um, selecting the patients, of course, you know, you have to look at their baseline functioning, MRS, two or below are offered thrombectomy at the moment. Um, and, um, and this is a, just a picture showing how uh, an MCA occlusion is uh, recanalized uh, uh, by procedure. Why thrombectomy has been successful more recently? I think they've been trying thrombectomy maybe uh, many years, but it's because of the devices. So thrombectomy devices have, uh, have, have really improved. Um, um, and and uh, this is a stent retriever. And I think the trials have been successful because of the improvements in the devices. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, so, so one of the commonly used stent uh, uh, retriever is, is solitaire. All these trials, um, they were published in one year, I think in 2015, five trials, thrombectomy trials. And um, uh, they, they unifyingly proven that thrombectomy uh, is, works for, for stroke patients. And again, this is sort of a meta-analysis showing that um, the odds ratio for, for um, uh, improving patient outcomes is, is significantly high, okay? So yeah, this again, sort of stent retriever on the left-hand side. And this, the right-hand side was aspiration device. Again, this is more commonly used as well nowadays um, with, with good benefits. Uh, probably stop there, I think. Yeah. Is yeah, that okay? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Excellent talk, excellent talk. Uh, you can uh, stop screen share. Thank you, Bahara, thank you. Thank you, yeah, thank you. So I think this is excellent. Uh, I'm sure uh, audience will have some questions. We will take it uh, uh, after Amil's uh, very strong. So uh, thank you, thank you, Bhai. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Dr. Amil Zedi, who is an uh, assistant professor of neurology at University of Cincinnati in USA. Um, and he is our uh, colleague of mine, our batchmate uh, from Pakistan. So over to you, uh, Amil. He's going to talk about migraines, management and diagnosis. Migraines very important. Thank you very much, Nassim. Um, let me see, share my screen. Can you see my screen okay? Yeah, we can. Yes. All right, so thanks for the invitation for this talk. So um, I'm gonna talk about just the uh, typical type of migraine. We don't have time to go through different types. So I'll be focusing on migraine very briefly on the pathophysiology and then more on the treatment side. So it is a kind of a highly prevalent uh, disease globally. Um, it's a kind of, in, in neurology, 
it's the second most prevalent in terms of the disability years to loss to disability. So one year prevalence of migraine is about 18% in women and 6% in men, and predominantly it affects the young people. Huge uh, financial burden, so it uh, cost uh, around $36 billion a year in the United States uh, um, in terms of uh, losing the um, employment days, especially. So this is a study in Lancet published uh, back in 2018 about the global burden of migraine and tension type headaches uh, between 1990 and 2016. So as uh, um, I said that it is a, a global burden, it's, a it's one of the most common, uh, pre commonly prevalent disease worldwide. So most prevalent, uh, it's in the Euro Europe area. So mostly in the Italy, Germany, France, these are the areas where migraine is most prevalent. So looking at the numbers here, so it's about uh, uh, more than 19,000 to 20,000 per 100,000 population. So 3 billion individuals were estimated uh, to have a migraine or tension type headache in 2016, and highest disability adjusted life years were uh, 100,000 in Italy, per 100,000 was in Italy, as we discussed, and then in Germany, then Thailand, Norway, and Spain. So this is again uh, taken uh, from the same study, looking, comparing the migraine and the tension type headaches. So the blue curve is the migraine and the, the bottom one is the tension type headache. So prevalence wise, tension type headache is more common than the migraine, but disability wise, migraine is far more disabling disease as compared to tension type headaches. Uh, global, years, global years of life uh, live with disability uh, per 100,000 population with migraine is 45.1 million as compared to the tension type headache, which is only 7.2 million. So coming to the diagnostic criteria of a typical migraine. So this diagnostic criteria is through the International Headache Society. So migraine uh, headaches, they need to fulfill this criteria to be labeled as migraine. At least five attacks uh, fulfilling the criteria from B to D. So the B is headache attacks uh, duration. So anywhere between four hours to 72 hours when the headache is not treated. And that particular headache uh, should have at least two of the following four characteristics, uh, uh, unilateral location, pulsating quality, moderate to or severe pain intensity, or aggravation by or causing avoidance of routine physical activity. And the headache should be accompanied with uh, nausea and or vomiting, photophobia and phonophobia, and should not be, could not be explained by any other a diagnosis. So that's how you diagnose migraine. So two broad categories of migraine is episodic migraine and chronic migraine. Episodic migraine on the basis of the duration, headaches occurring on one to 14 days per month. So fulfilling the criteria that we discussed and the chronic migraine if the headaches are going on more than 15 days a month for at least three months. And all of these, at least eight of those headaches should fulfill the typical migraine criteria then we call chronic migraine. It is important to make that distinction because that would make some changes to the management of migraine. So coming to the, uh, the phases of migraine, uh, um, so the most common mis misconception, especially in the patients and general population is the only class migraine is like the headache. So migraine starts much before the headache. So migraine starts usually hours to days before as a, as a prodromal phase. Uh, during that phase, uh, the typical symptoms are uh, depression, yawning, irritability, uh, difficulties in, in focusing, concentration, generalized fatigue, is difficulty in speaking, reading, nausea. These are the prodromal phase of migraine. This prodromal phase is followed by the aura only in population who do get migraine with aura, which is about one third. Um, so just about an hour before or half an hour before the typical migraine attack, uh, the aura could be 
either the visual aura, it could be the weakness of uh, the extremities, it could be loss of sight, sense, smell, things like that. And that is followed by the headache uh, that can last uh, from four hours to 72 hours uh, with this kind of characteristics that we discussed before, photophobia, phonophobia, insomnia, nasal congestion, throbbing pain. And then after the headache, there is a post-trauma phase that can last up to 42 hours. Again, headache is stopped, but the, but the uh, migraine continues with the fatigue, irritability, um, depression. So uh, this is the image taken from the study done in 2014. This is a functional um, neuroimaging, functional PET scan that was done during the prodromal phase of uh, migraine induced by nitroglycerin. So most commonly the area which was affected by the hypothalamus in the, so the prodromal phase as we go back, uh, um, so yawning, irritability, food cravings, mood disturbances, a lot of that comes from the hypothalamus. Um, so hypothalamus is the area and then the connection for hypothalamus to the brain stem, especially the tegmental part of the midbrain, uh, posterior or dorsal part of the pons and some of the cortical area. So the connection of the hypothalamus and uh, with the brain stem and rest of, of rest of the brain is what that uh, produce the prodromal phase. So the prodromal phase is followed by the aura in one third of the population, which is uh, predominantly explained on the basis of uh, um, cortical spreading depression. So cortical spreading depression briefly so it is connected with the prodromal phase. Prodromal phase leads to the, um, the activation or uh, it causes the depolarization wave. So the depolarization wave is due to the um, uh, potassium ion channels opens up, uh, potassium channels goes, uh, potassium ion goes out. That's due to the depolarization, slow depolarization wave followed by repolarization. And typically, most of the time, why we see the visual aura, because the most the cortical spread depression mostly originate from the occipital part of the cortex. So this occipital cortex involvement leads to the visual aura. So typical visual aura could be the scotoma, so the loss of part of vision, or it could be the fortifications, it could be the colorful lines, uh, um, uh, dots in the vision, or losing part of the vision. So this is how the depiction of how patients see uh, during the visual aura. This visual aura is followed by the headache. So the headache, uh, so briefly headache actually starts after the aura phase uh, due to the activation of the meningeal vessels. So the, especially the dural meninges, they are activated and they release the, the two important uh, neuropeptide. So one of them is the CGRP, which, which is calcitonin gene-related peptide. The other one is the pituitary adenylate cyclase pathway. So these two are the important neuropeptides. And out of these two, the most important is the CGRP. And, and that we would find out later in this presentation. So once these neuropeptides are released, so they are potent vasodilators. So they dilate the meningeal blood vessels. And that uh, then starts the cascade of events because around these meningeal vessels are the trigeminal nerve receptors that activate the trigeminal ganglion, then trigeminal cervical uh, complex between the brain stem and the cervical area. And that uh, spread the uh, wave to the rest of the brain. So whatever starts mainly it starts around the meningeal blood vessels. So that is why migraine is considered as a neurovascular disease. So, um, and then from the meningeal blood vessels, CGRP leads to vasodilation and that spreads the, that's activate the nociceptors and from the trigeminal ganglion, uh, this activation spreads to the rest of the brain that leads to the typical migraine headache. So we talked about the calcitonin gene-related peptide. It is one of the key player in the migraine pathogen uh, pathogenesis, and uh, it, it is activated at multiple sites. Uh, so 
predominantly around the meningeal area, but throughout the trigeminal nerve distribution, you see a lot of uh, the similar peptide. So it leads to the vasodilation of meninges and then activation of the nociceptors that leads to pain. So CGRP is released when the trigeminal ganglion is stimulated as we discussed. And it is seen in the different uh, studies that by injecting the CGRP, it, it can trigger the migraine attacks. So again, a similar kind of a picture, but more focusing on the release of CGRP um, from the meningeal area, then activating the trigeminal system, nervous system, and it is spreading the rest of the tri trigeminal pathway. So common triggers are the, of the migraine. Uh, the most common trigger is the stress. Um, and uh, in, uh, in females, the most common trigger after the stress is the is the menstrual cycles, changes in the hormone. Um, the other common trigger is uh, not eating, change in extreme change in weather, like extreme cold or extreme hot, and uh, sleep disturbances, some special type of food like chocolate, caffeine, um, alcohol definitely can uh, uh, trigger the migraines, um, and there are other triggers there as well. So coming to the migraine treatments, uh, what options do we have? Whenever we talk about the migraine treatment, the treatment is uh, broadly uh, categorized into acute migraine treatment and uh, uh, preventative migraine treatment. So there was a kind of uh, American Headache, uh, Headache Society consensus statement released recently, just summarized the, the treatment of migraine. So, <clears throat> It's very important to address the acute migraine. The reason is because uh, acute migraine converts into chronic migraine. If the acute migraine is not addressed properly, then it will change into either chronic migraine or it will change into chronic migraine plus medication overuse headaches. So depending upon the strategy of, the, of treating migraine. So unfortunately, like general practitioners or the people um, not having much information about migraine when they do prescribe a lot of simple analgesics or often the patients when they just go for the over-the-counter medications and they, they take a lot of uh, uh, paracetamol, acetaminophen, ibuprofen, and sometimes if you ask them, they will, they've been taking it every day for months and months. So that what lead to medication overuse headaches, and that is the mismanagement of migraine that will further compound the migraine. So typically mild to moderate attacks are managed by the over-the-counter painkillers, uh, um, acetaminophen, caffeinated analgesics combination, NSAIDs, and the pain if, the, if it's a moderate to severe attacks uh, and the attacks which are not controlled by the over-the-counter medication, then you go for the migraine specific agents, which are mainly the triptans, uh, uh, which are ergot uh, derivatives, CGRP receptor antagonist, and uh, which are the selective serotonin receptor agonist titans. So these are the most common ones, uh, what we have been seen for a number of years uh, for acute migraine with some uh, doses as well. So with this slide, there is a level of evidence A and B. So the A means there is a, a pretty strong established evidence that uh, these medications work for the acute attacks of migraine. And the B means that there is a probable effectiveness of the medication. So I'm not going to go for each and every medication, but these are the most common ones uh, like we discussed before. The important point, what I would like to mention here is that uh, um, for the acute attacks, the timing is extremely important when the, you, you need to educate the patient that as soon as they, when they feel the migraine, the headache is, is starting, which is just like one out of 10, two out of 10, just starting up, that is the time, that is the time to attack the migraine with medication. So if the migraine is not controlled by the over-the-counter medication, so the triptans uh, either alone or ideally along, uh, the combination of triptan with answers like naproxen, so sumatriptan, for example, plus naproxen, that works much better as compared to either of them, them alone. But the best thing, the, the, the most important thing is the timing. If they leave it for too late and the migraine has gone worse already, then they may not work. So the rescue treatments, so the rescue treatments are uh, the treatments that work more quickly and they are the one 
which are given through the injections like uh, cutaneous uh, sumatriptan or intramuscular injections of uh, steroids or other NSAIDs. Um, these are the self-administered ones and some are the office-based or inpatient options. So if the migraine is um, severe, if it's a status migrainous uh, or refractory migraine, then intravenous infusions can be given of uh, these medications and that works uh, very well. So one of the important question is when to move from the acute treatment towards the preventative treatment. So the important point that uh, the headache frequency is very important and the response to the medication for the acute treatment is important. If the headaches are more frequent, uh, six or more um, without disability, then they do uh, they are eligible for the preventative medication. There, sh there should be at least six or more headaches in a month. But if the headaches are less frequent, but they are very disabling headaches, uh, like three or four headaches, disabling ones, then still you can consider the preventative medication for these patients. The common prophylactic treatment options for the migraine, um, they've been in practice for years and years. For example, beta blockers. These are the top ones, uh, beta blockers and topramate, uh, especially if I can remember the NICE guidelines, until a couple of years ago. So these were the first line prophylactic medication for the, uh, for the migraine. Um, sodium valproate can be effective. So again, the level A evidence is established, uh, um, established evidence that these medications are effective. Then we have the, the groups tricyclic and depressants. is in, um, has been in use for a number of years now. Bunlofaxin, other beta blockers. Tendesartin can be very effective in some of the patients. Uh, other um, anti-epileptic medications are effective as well, but, the, but these are the most common ones. So coming to the new <clears throat> treatment, so we, uh, we talked about the CGRP as one of the important uh, neuropeptide that is uh, activating the migraine cascade. Um, so in the last uh, uh, probably 15 to 20 years, uh, Work a lot of work on was done on CGRP receptors, so, uh, that leads to a very fruitful results. Uh, so the new treatments uh, are targeting the CGRP receptors or the ligands of CGRP or the CGRP monoclonal antibodies. So they can work for both. Some of them are for both acute and uh, prophylactic treatments, and some are only for the prophylactic ones. So G pants. Uh, just coming back quickly, uh, so CGRP and neuropeptides release and they cause the vasodilation. If you see here, the CGRP is everywhere. This is the trigeminal nerve and the trigeminal nerve is going throughout the face. And if you look at the endings of the trigeminal nerve, you see the CGRP neuropeptides everywhere. So, so that is why the C, uh, targeting CGRP is extremely important because uh, that can reduce the vasodilation and other effects of CGRP and can improve the migraine headaches. So there is now a ton of evidence uh, that uh, these are the, so these are the G-Pent, Ceram g, -pent, g, -pent, Ubro g -pent. So, 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 so there is now a ton of evidence that these medications are effective in reducing the migraine frequency and they work for both uh, as an acute medication and some of them uh, like rimagipent and atagipent are also helpful for the preventive medication. So this is uh, the reason why it's important because this is the first medication which works for both acute and preventive uh, treatment pathways. Um, so we did talk about some of these medications before, but the, on this slide, uh, you also see some of the monoclonal antibodies. So um, aptinizumab, adenumab, uh, galcanizumab. So these are the monoclonal CGRP antibodies that work for the uh, prophylactic, uh, as the prophylactic migraine treatment. Uh, so these are given as injections and they are either like monthly injections or three monthly injections and uh, they work well for reducing the migraine frequency, especially in chronic migraine. Um, so Botox has been in use for a long time now, for uh, at least uh, uh, more than 20 years, uh, and uh, it has been effective, um, but uh, 
The evidence suggests that the effectiveness is about 40, 60. So 40% of patients may get the benefit. Uh, the rest do not get the benefit, but it's still it's one of the good treatment option. The other reason why these uh, um, uh, parenteral roots are important because often, as you know, that in migraine, there is uh, significant nausea, vomiting, and patients do not take or can't take the oral medications. So the injectables are extremely important in those patients because they reduce not only the acute attacks, but they also reduce the, the, the further future attacks of migraine. And if they are very nauseous, vomited, vomiting, then the, these options are much more useful. So as I said before, the monoclonal antibodies for preventive treatment of chronic migraine. So the, the meta-analysis was uh, done a couple of years ago, uh, going through the six different trials. In this trials, more than 3,000 patients uh, were enrolled who were given the like uh, CGRP receptor antibodies or the other CGRP um, medications. And uh, they did show a significant improvement in terms of the reduction in migraine frequency, reduction in the disabling the number of disabling days. So that is why now the CGRP monoclonal antibodies are now pretty uh, commonly used for the migraines. Sorry, I, uh, I can't hear you, Naseem. One minute, one minute, Amir. Got it. Um, so neuromodulation, uh, so I'm not going to spend much time. So this is something which is more recently has been approved in practice, especially in the USA, FD has approved at least three or four diff different neuromodulation techniques. So again, why important? Because uh, uh, if they are effective, then the people who do not take or can't take the medications, who, could, who cannot tell, tolerate the medication, so this is one of the non-invasive ways. Number of uh, uh, different neuromodulation techniques have been in practice now. Uh, so remote electrical nerve RAN stimulation is one of the recently approved uh, neuromodulation through FDA. TENS has been uh, approved as well. And vagus nerve stimulation has been approved for the prevention of prophylactic treatment. I'll just quickly, so this is one of the neuromodulation, quickly go through the uh, migraine in pregnancy, just two minutes for this. Uh, um, very difficult sometimes to treat patients who, uh, who are pregnant because most of these medications are contraindicated. Uh, so this chart just gives you an idea. None of the medication is absolutely safe in pregnancy. Uh, so the medication that can be used are the, uh, the category B medications, acetaminophane, metoclopramide, um, and then category C can be used in selected cases. Some of the triptans and SAIDs uh, can be used there. In severe refractory migraines uh, with risk and benefit ratios, uh, some of these medication can be used on the, like topramate can be used in those patients. And again, like I said, in neuromodulation would be much more safe option, although not many trials have been done, but in pregnancy, that would be much more common, uh, much more safe options. This slide just show the brief, uh, quickly in emergency treatment of pregnant patients in ER, um, like IV metoclopramide or IV magnesium sulfate, somatreptin, that can be used in, as an emergency treatment in pregnant patients. Um, just as a conclusion, it's a complex neurological disorder uh, with underlying state of increased responsiveness of cortical and subcortical networks. Um, attacks, as I said, are um, evolutive. Uh, so they start premonitory phase, then headache, then prodromal phase and one, of th one third of them can have aura freeze. CGRP is a kind of a um, good invention in the CGRP, especially in the last 20 years, that has changed the game in migraine treatment. And nowadays the targets are, that, that's the main, most common target for the, for the migraine, but despite of all of this, it still needs more effective treatment for the disease. So happy to take the questions, thank you. Thank you, Amit. Thank uh, you, Amit. Can you stop uh, sharing the screen? Sharing the screen, please. So, uh, Naseem, we can't. I can't hear you properly. I don't know if you have any issue with your mic, but I can't hear you. Okay, hang on. Okay, hang on. can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Naseem, uh, we've got difficulty in hearing you. Um, can you? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? 
it, it, there's a lot of echo. Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? That's yes, better. Is that better? Okay. Yeah. So, Amir, if you stop sharing your screen, please. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, I think, Mansoor, I think there are a couple of questions. Yes. Yeah, there are actually. So, let's start with the questions. Um, I can let me just go back to the questions. Uh, anyone, please, if you've got any questions, please put in the chat box. I'll start with the first question. I think that is for uh, Parat. Um, if if someone wakes up with a stroke and could have benefited from thrombolysis, but the hospital didn't have diffusion weighted imaging MRI or did not have MRI as such, uh, can can the patient sue the hospital? Um, yes, yes, yeah. Um... So um, I think the MRI scan facility, uh, especially in, in, in UK, uh, you know, for, for emergency situation is almost non-existent. So because it's all the funding issues. So I, I, I had experience one just a weekend, uh, last weekend I had a patient. So first one I thrombolized wake up uh, patient with uh, UWA flare mismatch. Uh, but I had to convince the radiologist, a young man who was 50 year old, a graphic designer and 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 uh, he came with dysphagia and and I had no choice to leave that patient not treated so I had asked radiologists and kindly did uh, scan but it's not it's not possible to uh, do um, uh, f uh, f you know everywhere and uh, it's not funded and so on but the patient should be coming to stroke units all the stroke patients are should be cared in a hyperacute stroke unit, because not just the thrombolysis treatment, or thrombectomy treatment, patients benefit from being in hyperacute stroke unit because um, uh, it's been well proven that they should be looked after in a stroke unit, uh, no matter whether they have received reperfusion treatments or not. Thank you, Bharat. Bharat, I've got another question related to stroke. Um, you, you did actually show a slides on the complications of thrombolysis. Um, now, suppose when you when you see a patient or your precious nurse sees a patient and the patient is obviously confused um, uh, and, and not able to sort of actually understand the implications of thrombolysis, how would you go about consenting and, and obviously explain the complications? Is it a family or do you, do you just do it in the best interest of the patient? So um, um, uh, we have a kind of a, a very strict checklist we have to go through. Uh, to make sure the patient uh, has no contraindications for thrombolysis. And then we also have a consent procedure. If the patient cannot consent, we must have a relative to, uh, to consent on patients we have. Otherwise, we, uh, we don't thrombolyze in our center uh, because of the medical legal issues. Um, and, and of course, the, yeah, you, have, you have to explain the risk, uh, the, the benefit um, depending on when they're coming within three hours or within four and a half hours. Um, and uh, we have to explain the risk of bleeding, uh, which is about 4%, 4 to 5%. But sometimes uh, we have to say, well, how much of that is more life-threatening? About 2% of the patients uh, can have life-threatening bleeding, uh, more serious bleeding. Uh, and you have to explain about anaphylaxis risk, which again varies um, from anywhere from 1% uh, to 7% chance of anaphylaxis uh, risk. So, so that is again in the, pro in, in, in the consenting uh, process and uh, discussing the risks of the treatment. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Nakri, anything to add to that? No, I think that's a very comprehensive answer from Bharat. I agree with you. I think, I think the question was recently asked in probably more relevant, I think for US where it's all like private system. But mm -hmm. if if you have D, if you have MRI, then obviously Bharat is right. You have to push for it, see if it can help. But obviously, if the hospital does not have MRI, then there is nothing you can do really, um, because as Bharat said, you know, time is brain. You just have to make decisions on the basis of CT. Uh, if you don't have it, what can you do? But if you have it, I think you have to push for it and see if it if it can help. So I think Bharat is absolutely right um, that he pushed for it, and I hope it benefited that um, that patient. Yeah, completely agree. Thank you I think very much. A question to Amir about migraine. If somebody is uh, saying that they have Googled the symptoms and now they are taking frequent, <laughs> they frequent time off and saying that I am having recurrent migraines, then is there any test that we can do or we just have to rely on their story? 
Amit? So I think uh, going through the diagnostic criteria, so you, the history is pretty important, asking about the type of migraine, characteristic of migraine, uh, unilateral or not, uh, um, with other symptoms, photophobia, phonophobia, nausea, vomiting. So yes, going through the, the diagnostic criteria, if that fulfills, then yes, uh, you take it as a migraine and uh, it then you start the treatment. Migraine is pretty common. so. I mean, some of the neurologists, uh, they don't believe in tension type headaches, so they just say everything is migraine. So so, so obviously, then you have to take uh, what the patient is saying, but uh, um, treatment is important. As I said before, um, most of the time, the patients do not go to the doc GP or go to the um, doctor to seek any kind of medical attention. And that's why one of the reasons they just uh, um, take, keep taking medications. Mm -hmm. And that makes the things worse. Um, so, so many patients we see in clinic, they've been taking the paracetamol for months and months. And some of them taking codeine as well. So that is all kind of a poison in migraine. So, because that will make the migraine more difficult to treat. And uh, with medication overuse headaches, um, uh, treating medication overuse headaches itself is not easy. So I think uh, history is important. Um, and if you find out, if you, when you take the history, you will see that some of these patients, or not some, most of these patients, they actually have developed uh, med medication overuse headaches. So that's why they are um, more, dis uh, more disabled. Thank you. Um, I mean, that was a very insightful talk, actually. And um, some questions about migraine. When do you think that the general practitioners, non-neurologists, should be taking the migraines or the headaches of these migraine patients seriously? What are the red flags, um, in, in other words? So when you say red flags, so you're thinking not it's a migraine mimic, so it's not migraine when you say red flags? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so yes, so the important things, especially... Um, one of the red flag uh, uh, is about the looking for the raised intracranial pressure because uh, migraine is very common in females and uh, um, IAH is also common in females. And IAH, uh, uh, if you misdiagnose or if you do not diagnose IAH correctly, then the patients can lose vision very quickly. So, mm -hmm. So one of uh, the important thing is uh, the characteristic, again, going back on the basics, going back to the basics, history is important. Um, so if you see any features of raised intracranial pressure uh, commonly, or kind of a bit of a specifically for the IEH is like visual obscurations. So visual obscuration is asking the patient like on changing the position, do you see any change in the vision? So bending forward, sitting up, and then losing vision for microseconds. So that is what visual obscuration is. And the history of tinnitus is very important. Um, so, so if that is there, um, nighttime headaches, headaches disturbing the sleep. So migraine should never disturb the sleep. So migraine always gets better with sleep. So if anyone having headaches at nighttime and uh, headaches uh, um, waking them up from sleep, they can, that cannot be migraine nine out of 10 times. That would be something else. Early morning headaches would be something else. Mm -hmm. So asking for these questions would be helpful. Excellent. Um, you did touch about, thank you very much for that. You did touch about um, chronic prevention of these migraines. What else could be improve the quality of life for patients who suffer from chronic migraines? What else to improve quality of life? Yeah, what else could be done apart from medications? So, so uh, the important thing is uh, the non-pharmacological options are very important. Uh, there has been studies, uh, I did not have a time to add on those studies uh, that exercise help in reducing migraine. So uh, four to five days of uh, workout, uh, it can be any workout, but aerobic exercises of 30 minutes to 40 minutes uh, can reduce the migraine attacks. So there are some biofeedback strategies uh, plus uh, there is some evidence that acupuncture does work uh, for the migraine as well. Um, massage can work sometimes as well. So these uh, non-pharmacological options should be tried and plus uh, changing the lifestyles. Uh, 
as, uh, looking for the triggers is very important. Um, mm -hmm. Different people have different triggers. So th the other misconception is that uh, caffeine triggers migraine in everyone. That's not true. In some people with migraine, caffeine does not touch migraine at all. So they can drink caffeine and no problem with that. So triggers are specific to specific patients. So identifying the trigger is extremely important and try to avoid the trigger is something that can prevent taking from medication. So, so that's not, that, that would be the best thing. Thank you. Thank you once again. Uh, that's it, Naseem, from my end. I think, I think there is time for just one last question from uh, Rashid Haq, who is asking, what is the best prophylactic treatment medicine in children for migraine? So, I mean, I have not done the child neurology, but uh, I still, uh, the propranolol still can be given in the children, depending upon, I mean, the age, it can be given between um, even the children is 12 years old or 12 years or above, above, it can be used, uh, beta blockers can be used as a good treatment option in children as well. Even topramate can be used um, in the older children. These two are the best treatment options for protected uh, migraine. Thank you. So, Mansu, I think we can conclude the session. So, yes, thank you very much. We should conclude, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Amir, uh, Dr. Zaidi. Uh, thank you, Bharat, Dr. Sharipali, for excellent talks, uh, very important topics, strokes and migraines, uh, very well received. Um, we had some really good attendance as well. So we will be back next month, last uh, Sunday of uh, February, 26th of February. And um, I hope you are all able to access your cert CPD certificates. The link was shared. Uh, it's a Dropbox link. No need to open any Dropbox account. You just click on the link and you will be able to download your certificate and then you can put your name on that. So thank you very much to our program coordinator, Dr. Mansoor Ali, and we will be back uh, uh, next month. Thank you. 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 Bye -bye. Bye -bye.